time has a real influence on the quality of our snap judgments. Um, now, this is an odd thing to think about because usually when we think about shooting and about shootouts between, um, you know, we have a kind of Hollywood notion of what shootings are. And in Hollywood, when a cop's shooting a bad guy, it takes place, you know, over 10 minutes. And they're hunkered down, they shout out things to each other, and they roll around, and they run after each other, and everything is incredibly drawn out. And you get a sense that that's how shootings are. That is nothing like how shootings are. If you look at real-world shootings, they're happening so quickly that the ability of anyone involved to make any kind of sophisticated judgment is completely impaired. Let me give you, I, I talked a lot when I was doing my book with um, Gavin De Becker, the guy who wrote that wonderful book, Gift of Fear, and who runs a... Uh, 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 runs a um, bodyguard agency in LA, security agency. And he's a student of political assassinations. And he's studied all the tapes, all the assassinations we have on tape, he's studied them and broken them down. And he was telling me about, um, he did an analysis of the shooting of Reagan in, in um, you know, March 30th, 1981. And we all know, sorry, Reagan's coming out of the Washington Hilton, there's a big crowd of people around him, they're shouting out, you know, Mr. President, Mr. President. And all of a sudden, John Hinckley comes to the crowd you see this arm appear, he's got like a 22 in his hand, and he fires six times, right? Boom, 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 boom. And he hits James Brady, and he hits a Secret Service officer, and he hits the car, and he sends a bullet through Reagan, and there's two other shots that go, um, that go awry. Now, here's the interesting question about that. How does Tinkley get off six shots? Have you thought about that? Reagan is surrounded by bodyguards, by trained Secret Service officers who are incapable of stopping someone from coming up and getting off six shots. Well, here's the answer. Because the total time that elapses from the moment John Hinckley appears till it becomes obvious that someone's pointing a gun at the president, to the moment that he lies on the ground, having been wrestled down by Secret Service officers, is 1.8 seconds. In 1.8 seconds, you can't do anything except reach for your own gun, right? There's no time to make any kind of rational judgment. In fact, De Becker has this really wonderful riff where he says that um, bodyguards should not carry guns. And they shouldn't carry guns because um, when an actual attack happens, it happens so quickly that the last thing you want a bodyguard to do is to waste whatever 1.5 or 1.7 or 2 seconds they have going for their gun. They don't have time to get their gun out and fire a shot. The only thing they have time to do is to interpose themselves between the, the attacker and the person they're protecting, right? That's all they have to do. And if you look at the Reagan tape, it's really interesting. Here's what all the bodyguards do. You see this one guy who's like walking behind Reagan, right? Hinkley appears, and this guy, is how he spends the 1.8 seconds. You see him go into his pocket and pull out a big submachine gun. At which point, <laughs> Reagan's been shot, right? And by the way, what are you doing with a submachine gun in the middle of a huge crowd of innocent people? Huh? So they don't have time. If we speed things up, people don't have time to react. Really and there's some really wonderful research done by a guy named um, Ashiz. It was also done, a similar research was done here at the University of Washington, where they do a kind of computer simulation of what happened with Diallo. And what they do is they sit you down at a computer and they flash a black male face on the screen. And then they give you one of two things will happen. Either a gun comes on the screen, and if a gun comes up, you've got to hit a button here. And if a wrench comes up, you've got to hit a button here. And they want to see, um, you know, how often do you make a mistake? How often do you call the wrench a gun or the gun a wrench. Um, now, there's all kinds of interesting findings to this. One is that if you flash a white face on the screen first, you're far less likely to make a mistake. Right? Our snap judgments when we're confronted with a white person first are a lot better. Right? Now, but that's not the really interesting finding. The interesting finding is that the faster I speed that process up, the more quickly I put I demand you to respond, and the more quickly I put that wrench or the gun up on the screen, the more likely you are to call everything a gun. To the point where if I get it as fast as we can humanly do it, all you do when you see a black face first is just go gun, 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 gun. Right? That's because if you speed things up so too much, we can no longer make any kind of sophisticated judgment about the situation. We are left with our basest instincts. We are left completely stripped of the ability to do any sort of sophisticated mind reading. All we have left is this incredibly reductive and completely unfair assumption that if there's a black face, a young black face involved, it's probably going to be a gun. Right? Under time pressure, we start to make lower and lower and lower 
quality judgments. And more than that, we start to exclude certain kinds of information that's absolutely critical um, to, uh, uh, to making successful judgments. We start to resort simply to stereotypes. And that's why police departments are so obsessed with time. Police training is all about buying time, right? What do they teach cops? To seek cover and concealment. Why do you have a cop seek cover and concealment? To slow the situation down. When you stop, you should have pulled over by a cop at night. And the, you know, what does the cop do? He parks behind you, and then he walks, if he's well trained, then he walks up slowly along to the driver's side of the car, and what does he do? He stops behind you, right? And shines his flashlight over your shoulder. Why is he doing that? He's doing that because if you actually have a gun, he's bought himself an extra two seconds. Because if the cop's behind you and you want to shoot him, here's what you have to do. Take your gun out, first of all, and he can see it because he's shining with his flashlight. Twist around in the seat, go over, and fire through the window. Really hard to do. Takes about two or three seconds, or probably less than that. But if he's in front of you, it's a lot more simple for you. Right? You just got to go boom. You shoot him. That's training. And that training is allowing the cop to make a far higher quality decision about what your intentions are. He's buying himself some time. And that time may well save your life, because you want to be in a situation where the cop has the greatest amount of time and isn't reduced to making the most stereotypical um, autistic um, decision. The, um, it's also why bodyguards are obsessed with what they call white space. Right? The big difference between how President Bush is protected today and the way that Reagan was protected 20 years ago is that if you look at the videotape of him coming out of the Hilton, the most striking thing is that all the crowd is all around Reagan, right? There's about a foot that separates all of these well-wishers and someone who wanted to do Reagan great harm and Reagan himself. That would never happen today. Why? Because there's only, if there's only a foot of separation, you have no time as a bodyguard to, re to react. Now when a public figure goes out in public, there's 20 feet separating them and anyone um, in the public. Because that 20 feet gives you as a bodyguard that extra moment that allows you to make a much higher quality snap decision. It's also the reason why many police departments have been moving towards um, single officer squad cars. Why is that? Because cops by themselves make much better decisions than cops in groups. When cops are in groups, they speed things up. Right? They take risks. They feel emboldened. Right? They don't slow things down. They're rash. They, 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 they'll put themselves in situations where they don't have the time or the ability to make a high-quality judgment. But a single officer slows things down. A single officer would never chase in after someone into a house. Of course not. He would sit in his car and he would call for backup. He would slow the situation down. Um, and if you look at statistics of police violence and when stupid, police do stupid things, it is beautifully correlated with the number of cops in a group. The more cops there are together, the more likely they are to be accused of brutality, to draw their gun when they're not supposed to, to fire weapons when they're not supposed to. The significance of all this, I think, um, is it, it's, it's a reminder of how sort of impoverished our ideas, our explanations for failure are. And this is a, something that I try to get at in Blink. And that's when we interpret when a situation where something went terribly wrong, when people make snap judgments, when we looked at something like the Diallo case, for example, one of our first responses is to say, that's just about racism. Right? It's what happens when racist cops confront. Um, and that may be true, but it's a wholly insufficient way of making sense of what happened that night doesn't get you anywhere. It doesn't get to an understanding of why in this particular instance they would have gone beyond whatever feeling they had in their hearts and done something profoundly stupid and something profoundly tragic. Um, but most of all, I think it's a reminder of how fragile these kinds of gifts that we take for granted really are. All of us rely on our ability to make these kinds of snap judgments, and most of the time we're pretty good at it. Like I said, if you walk out here tonight and you're walking down an alley and you see someone coming at you, you will be really good at distinguishing between someone who is threatening and someone who doesn't pose a threat to you at all. But that ability is not robust, and we cannot take that ability for granted. And one of the themes I come back to again and again in Blink is that we need to understand that and to construct environments in which decisions are made that protect these kinds of snap judgments from all kinds of biases um, and discriminations. <laughs>